Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our second CARE event of the semester. Um, so CARE is conversations about research ethics, and the aim is to try and bring outside experts who are working on sort of cutting edge issues related to research ethics and have them be in conversation with OSU researchers who have in their practice really experienced some of these challenges and um, try and spark a conversation. So thanks for coming. Um, one thing that I want to highlight before uh, starting the event is, um, so we are going to be having a training program that is built on these conversations. We've been videoing these conversations for the past year. And this is really geared for junior researchers, graduate students, postdocs, um, junior faculty who are interested in getting sort of um, NIH requirements aligned research ethics um, that is based on some of these issues. So what we're going to be doing is you watch the videos, um, you have some supplemental readings, and then we're gonna come in and have a discussion with um, an ethical, uh, like someone trained in ethics, uh, that are related to more personal issues, like sort of cases that would be related to um, uh, what a junior researcher would experience um, with conflicts of interest or with co-authorship. So they're really geared to um, sort of people in the lab and uh, maybe your graduate students that are interested in furthering uh, thinking about research ethics. So uh, this is where you, uh, I don't know where the thing is. Anyway, it's gonna cycle through. Um, go to go.osu.edu slash research ethics and you'll be able to find it. All right, to no further ado, um, welcome and we're going to be talking about the ethics of paying research subjects today. Um, sometimes this is something that people don't really talk about. They kind of think that it's like a given um, and it's like an obvious parameters, but I think this is like super interesting and the work that people like, um, uh, Professor Prasad are working on is like really sort of making us rethink some of our preconceived notions of what it means to pay researchers to, I mean, to pay research participants to potentially exploit them, and also whether this idea of undue influence is really like a thing. Um, so that's uh, hopefully some of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm really excited about the panelists. So um, our outside speaker is Govind Prasad. He's um, a professor of law and also has a PhD in philosophy. Um, and his research interests center on the legal and ethical dimensions of health insurance, healthcare financing, and markets in healthcare services, as well as professional ethics um, and the regulation of medical research. And he just recently co authored a paper on the ethics of differential payments of research participants. So in one study, paying different participants a different sum of money. So hopefully he'll shed some wisdom on that. Um, and we also have our internal uh, panelists are um, Professor Maria Gallo from College of Public Health, uh, the Division of Epidemiology at OSU. Um, she is a sexual and reproductive health epidemiologist. Um, she's conducted research primarily in low resource settings for almost two decades including um, research related to HIV and STIs, contraception and abortion in Jamaica, Madagascar, Mozambique, Kenya, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And finally, we have Amanda Robinson, uh, who is in political science, um, associate professor, and she, is, she works on the interaction between culture and politics in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and she's particularly working in Malawi, uh, most of her research. Um, and so we're going to basically have uh, Professor Prasad come and give sort of a short presentation, getting us all on the same page about some of the ethical issues and some of the more interesting work that he's been sort of working on. And then we're going to give Professor Gallo and Professor Robinson a chance to just sort of give their own thoughts and experiences about paying research subjects in the field. Um, and then we have sort of a structured conversation around agreed upon questions for about 30 minutes and then we'll open it up to you, the audience. So keep on thinking about questions as you're um, listening and we'll have a, plenty of time to field questions um, for the last half hour of the discussion. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> 
Um, great. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm, I'm uh, really excited to be here um, and to be talking to this group about um, payment and research ethics. And I'm excited, I'm excited for the discussion we'll have um, afterward. Um, so what I want to do um, in these 15 minutes um, are a couple things. Um, one is to kind of walk through um, a taxonomy of some of the reasons why we might think that um, paying folks to participate in research is um, ethically interesting, could be ethically complex. Um, uh, talk about some of the um, ethical concerns we might have um, about um, payment, and then also uh, give a little introduction to some of the, um, what I think is some of the most interesting um, research. Um, often some of it combines uh, philosophical with empirical research to try to look at whether um, uh, what people believe about when it's ethical or um, how payment might actually affect or not affect um, participant behavior. Um, so. Um, the first slide I, I uh, want to give you, and by the way, I have these um, on Twitter. So if you go to um, Govin Prasad on Twitter, you can see these slides in PDF and also uh, links to some of the papers. Um, so the, the first thing I, I want to talk about is um, a framework. And um, what I um, have here, I, I borrow from a recent framework that um, some folks um, published, I believe, in um, the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, on um, different reasons why we might pay participants in research. Um, so I divide this up slightly differently from how they do, but um, fairly similarly. And um, I think that there are essentially um, four categories of reasons why we might pay participants. So two are what I call um, backward looking. So we're paying them not to get them to do something, but we're paying them um, because we think it's appropriate to pay them given what they've done. Um, so we might pay people in a backward looking way um, in the form of reimbursement, so reimbursing them for expenses they undertook to be in the study. Um, we might pay them um, by way of compensation. So you might give them um, money for the time or the effort or the sacrifice that they uh, put in. And you might also pay them um, in a forward-looking way to try to get them to do something instead of paying them for what they've done. So you might offer an um, incentive payment to try to um, encourage enrollment in a clinical trial. The last category, which I think is um, less common but worth noting, is that there are some research studies where you might actually pay people as an inherent part of the um, experiment you're running itself. So say you're doing social science research on something like the ultimatum game where people are dividing up a sum of money. You might actually pay participants as part of the research rather than to reimburse, compensate, or as an incentive. Um, and um, these are not unique um, practices to research. Something that I want to kind of underscore is that we see these practices in non-research settings. So for example, when you're bringing a visiting speaker to give a talk, um, you might offer them reimbursement for coming to the talk. You might, um, so actually what wasn't true here, you might offer them com <laughs> compensation or an in, in, in incentive payment to, to get them to, to come. Um, um, so, um, I, I imagine, I haven't seen this, you could even have a talk where for some reason it was an inherent part that the, research, the visiting speaker was like paid on stage as part of an experiment. Um, <laughs> but the, the general point is that I think we see a lot of these practices outside of research. That's not to say that research can't raise unique questions, but that I tend to think that this sort of, um, there's a continuum between the way that we see these practices operating outside of clinical research, um, outside of, um, uh, social science research and um, the way that we see them operating inside of research. Um, so let me turn first to reimbursement. So this is the, the sort of the, the first category. Um, so I think the, the goal of reimbursement is to try to make sure that um, being in research is at worst financially neutral for the participants. So examples would be um, if you're running a study or bringing out of state participants, you might have travel reimbursements, you might have a voucher for the hotel that they stay in. And one question that um, uh, uh, I thought about in this paper that I co-authored with um, Emily Largent and Holly Lynch at Penn, and you'll see more of Emily and Holly's research um, in these slides. One research that we thought about when we were talking about differential reimbursement was, is it required to reimburse participants, or is it just that it's permitted, but there might be circumstances where it could be okay to um, uh, have a trial where you didn't necessarily reimburse for 
say, fairly small expenses or if people were fairly well off. For instance, again, going back to outside of research, um, you can imagine that, you know, say, you know, I'm a professor at a law school, I have a travel budget. Say that an undergrad group that didn't have much money um, would like to invite me to give a talk. I might go to give the talk even though I'm not being reimbursed. There's a question about um, when it's ethical or unethical to not reimburse as a part of a trial. You might think it looks different if a prestigious university which has money offers somebody who doesn't have a travel fund the opportunity to talk without a reimbursement um, to sort of raise their profile. That might raise different questions from my example about uh, sort of a faculty member at a law school not being reimbursed by undergrads. Um, uh, the next category, I think, is compensation. So um, here we might think um, there's an idea that we have to provide um, appropriate, particip uh, appropriate payment. And I think there's a lot of um, complexity here about what it means for payment to be appropriate um, to participants for um, what they've done as part of the research. Um, so examples are we might pay people um, for the time that they spend participating in the study. Some people have proposed what's called a wage payment model, where you kind of take what the prevailing local wage would be for that similar type of work and pay that in research. Uh, you might pay to offset the risk or burden of research. This tends to be more controversial. Um, empirically, a lot of IRB members tend to be uncomfortable with paying to offset risk. And then you might also pay participants. Um, this is an interesting proposal. It's actually interviewed after publishing this paper with Emily and Holly. Um, Wired called me to interview me about a proposal to basically pay participants for the value of their data, where what this um, uh, initiative wanted to do was to basically have micropayments for the value of um, data about subjects that was being used to train an AI. And the idea is that you might pay people for the value of data. Um, so the questions here, I think, um, are about how do you determine appropriate payment? So um, for instance, um, is it f um, fair to pay different amounts at different research sites if the prevailing local wage is different? And another is about whether compensation is uh, required or just permitted. Um, so the next uh, category is this um, category of incentives. So the goal of incentives here, I think, is going to be to recruit participants in a study. So for instance, um, uh, we often pay, um, if we're doing a sort of large um, social science survey, we might pay undergrads a token sum of money to participate in, say, a big um, public opinion survey. When I was an undergrad, I did some surveys at the Graduate School of Business that were like this. We might pay healthy volunteers in a research study um, to do an MRI. And um, some of the questions that incentives raise, I think incentives tend to be the area that raise the most ethical questions in these discussions, are about both are they, um, it tends to be less about whether they're required. There's a question, can incentives ever be required? It's more often a question about whether a given incentive is okay or whether it's prohibited for some reason. And also um, there are questions about um, what it is that might make an incentive um, fair or unfair. I think part of why incentives might be controversial is that um, they kind of fit with a traditional economic account that sits uneasily with um, people's sort of intuitions about um, getting people to do things, which is that traditionally in economics, people tend to think wages and prices are incentives. They're forward looking. They're trying to get people to do things. And people don't always like this. So people um, often have commitments to the idea that wages shouldn't be forward looking. They shouldn't be just incentives. They should have to do with um, other values come in like equality, like compensation for burden, and I think that complicates a lot of ethical discussions about incentives. Um, so I want to turn now, now that I've given you this sort of three-part framework of uh, reimbursement, compensation, incentives, uh, I'm not going to talk much about that fourth category of intrinsic. I think it's important to recognize, but it's not as, um, I think, going to be as relevant here. Um, now I, I want to turn for the rest of the talk to focusing on some of the um, ethical concerns we might see. Um, so. Um, I have a taxonomy here um, that kind of divides them up into concerns that are focused on research subjects, research participants, and um, concerns that are focused on um, harms or bad effects on the trial. Um, so I have um, this category, this um, kind of table of um, seven different um, types of subject-centered concerns you might have, and I'm going to sort of walk you through these. Um, so the first one that you sometimes see is people are worried about um, a payment in research being coercive. And the traditional account of this by research ethicists is um, a payment is coercive if it um, sort of 
um, gives the person um, no other choice to participate, or they are being um, threatened with um, deprivation of a right. Um, a lot of people in research ethics um, have prominently argued that payments in general can't be coercive. They can be um, ethically objectionable for other reasons, but it's rare that payments are going to coerce because it's rare, or I think um, Alan Wertheimer, for instance, argued that it's impossible because um, payments aren't generally going to deprive people of something that they had a right to. So they're not going to be like the classic coercion situation of your money or your life where someone is threatening someone with deprivation of their rights. Um, but as you'll see in one of some of the future slides, um, you do get um, cases where IRBs do think that payments are coercive despite this understanding that research ethicists often have. The next category is undue inducement. So um, uh, again, this and coercion are raised typically by too much money, and they tend to apply more often to incentives. So undue inducement often um, is understood as a case where payment leads to um, the participant um, being unable to accurately perceive um, risk and burden. Um, exploiting a kind of cognitive weakness of the participants, so leading them to make decisions they wouldn't have made if they weren't confronted with, say, an overly large sum of money. Um, I, I'll give you a slide in the future that suggests that you know this could happen, but it's pretty rare. It's not clear, actually, that larger payments lead empirically to people being um, psychologically vulnerable and um, not being able to accurately perceive risk, for instance. Um, a different uh, worry you might have, which has to do with too little payment, and it applies, I think, both to incentive and to compensation, is what people call a worry about exploitation. So you might worry that um, if you pay somebody too little to do something, you're kind of taking unfair advantage of their um, circumstances that make them willing to take such little money. Um, that's a worry that you see about exploitation in research, and that came up a lot in debates about international um, clinical trials in less developed countries. Um, a fourth concern, which um, I think is often what people are really talking about when they are using terms like coercion or undue inducement, is um, uh, uh, what we might call financial motives. So um, it's a question of whether we care about the reason why participants are in research and um, whether it's objectionable if the participant and the researcher's motives don't align, so if they have different reasons for um, being in research. Um, so um, even reimbursement can raise questions about financial motives. So if I um, don't participate in research only to get a reimbursement, but it's true that I wouldn't do the research if I didn't get the reimbursement, then a financial motivation is playing a role in why I participate. And people, and it might even be true that but for that reimbursement, I wouldn't be in the research. So that is the sort of tipping point factor. And I think in some cases, the um, relative weight of a financial as opposed to an altruistic or other motive um, makes people concerned or uncomfortable. I think it's important that research participants participate for non-financial reasons. Um, last few categories, um, some people worry about commodification. They worry, especially in research that might pose risk or harm, that it's wrong to put a dollar value on a medical procedure or a harm to the body. Um, this can come up, but it's rare. I think people sometimes worry about harm to subjects from being paid. You might think, you know, how could it be harmful to have more money? In general, I think it's not going to be harmful, but you can have circumstances where having money leaves somebody vulnerable to being harmed by others who might want to take their money, or you might end up in a case where you have um, participants who are um, maybe don't have full decisional capacity and you worry they might make harmful decisions if given um, money. I actually have seen this when I sat on the IRB at Johns Hopkins. Some members sort of raised questions about payment that are, were mo motivated by these kinds of concerns. The last category, which I think is a really broad one, is about distributive <coughs> injustice. And you might worry about um, payment, especially again, this may come up more in low resource settings. If you're paying a lot to people in a trial, you might produce inequalities between trial participants and others in the community. Um, you might have worries about if you pay people too little, um, kind of related to exploitation about the ways this might aff affect um, f um, economic distribution in the community. Um, so I'm just going to walk through now some of the more empirical um, research that I think here is really interesting. So this slide is from a paper by um, Scott Halperin and others in 2004. And it's looking at um, 
basically people's willingness to participate in research um, mapped against the chance of um, experiencing an adverse effect that is described to participants. And you see that the odds of um, participating go down as the adverse effect becomes more likely. Um, and the odds of participating are higher the more you're getting paid. So if you're getting paid 2,000, um, you're more likely than if you're getting paid 100. But the important part that Halpern brings out is that it's not um, the case that the amount of payment distorts the um, perception of risk. So you actually see the same line of decrease, more or less, regardless of how much they're being paid. And the study, um, if, if you click on the link that I have on at the end, um, you'll see that he argues that this suggests that um, payments, at least within the bounds that he looks at, don't create what are called undue inducements. Um, another um, category um, that's interesting here is this discussion about coercion and undue influence. So um, this is a slide from a paper by Emily Largen and others that surveyed IRB members. And the thing that I find really striking is the way that they described, IRB members described coercion, which I think tends to make, especially philosophers in research ethics, sort of tear their hair out, which is um, the IRB members said that if somebody um, will participate when otherwise they wouldn't have, they say, um, a majority says, it's, not, it's coercive then, and even more say it's unduly influential. And yet in my example about the reimbursement, this is actually not true. I would have come even if I didn't get a reimbursement. But if the reimbursement like made the difference for me, the idea would be that then the reimbursement is coercive. And I think this strikes a lot of um, ethicist writing as a really um, overly expansive sort of conception of coercion. But the study shows that it's also sort of widespread. Again, the way I explain this is that maybe people are using the word coercion when they really mean something like financial motivation. But I think this is an interesting empirical um, piece. Um, so I want to, um, I have uh, limited time, so I want to go quickly through the rest of what I have. Um, I want to focus um, on some interesting empirical research on a study-centered concern, so not a concern about um, uh, the participant, but about the study, which is that you might worry that paying people might motivate deception. You might worry about it skewing the sample or using research resources, so payment does cost money you could use for something else. Um, Holly Fernandez Lynch, one of my co-authors on the differential payment study, recently did an empirical project on deception where, um, uh, let me see if I can describe it accurately, basically your dark blue bar is the rate that people said they had been vaccinated when the payment was not contingent on whether you'd been vaccinated or not um, for, for the flu. And then the, the light blue and the white bars are um, varying the condition to see, did people, um, if you say that you get the money only if you've been vaccinated or only if you haven't, they start misreporting whether they've been vaccinated. And interestingly, you see that for all the payment conditions, and you don't actually see it increase as you go from, I think, 5 to 10 Dollars. I forget what their highest payment condition is. So what they find is that there is this effect um, potentially on deception um, from payment. Um, so um, uh, the, the, here are some of the other issues that you might think about. You know, differential payment, uh, cash versus in-kind payment, um, whether financial and medical benefit raise different issues. Um, and then I just want to leave you with, I'll skip over this um, last slide. Um, uh, just to thank you and to say, um, we'll see some more slides from my other participants, but I'm looking forward to the discussion. And you do have this um, on uh, Twitter. I have tweeted this um, uh, set of slides and also linked to a bibliography of um, some of the recent work on this. So now I'm going to invite the panelists and Govin to come up. Um, that might make us turn a little bit for Amanda's slides, but I think that that should be fine. Um, yes. Am I gonna go next? Yeah, why don't you start and then, so. Uh, so Professor Robinson and Professor Gallo are gonna speak for 15 minutes around about their own experiences with paying research subjects and then we're gonna have a discussion. <laughs> 
for having me be part of this panel. I um, do quite a bit of research. I think about ethics all the time, but I am not a professional in terms of how to connect these. So it's really useful to follow Govan, who outlined a lot of things, and I'm going to talk about how they applied in some of the settings where I've worked. Um, Okay, so I wanted to start with why, how I think about the need for payment, um, which for me is, is really about fairness. I don't know if you can see, no you cannot, it's cut off. Um, I work in Malawi, which is south of where this map ends, <laughs> a small country in central southern Africa. Um, all of my research um, that's published to date, almost all of my research, has come from data that I've collected in Malawi. And like other Global North researchers who work in the Global South, um, I benefit intellectually, professionally, and ultimately economically from the information that people are willing to share with me. I would not have gotten tenure at Ohio State, at least not with the work that I um, do now, had people been unwilling to share information with me. Um, and in my experience, people understand this, that I'm benefiting, that the people that are working with me are benefiting, and that it seems fair that they're giving their time and effort towards this research, that they should also benefit. Um, it's also relevant that the kind of work that I do um, compared um, to others on the panel doesn't have immediate benefits for the people that I study. I'm interested in how identity is used in the uh, process of political mobilization. So there might be some long-term benefits, but it's not the case that I'm offering some kind of um, medical intervention or something that's immediately of interest to people or of use to them in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so. Where is lavender? Is it possible to rescale this? Yeah, I might have to fiddle with it first. Okay. So first, in terms of thinking about giving cash, um, a couple of things have come up in the course of my research in Malawi. So early on, I did give cash um, for most of my studies. And more recent studies, I have not given cash. Um, so some of the arguments against paying participants in cash at least for survey responses, which is typically what I'm doing, collecting um, survey data from regular people living in rural parts of Malawi. Um, so the regulatory board, what's essentially the IRB for Malawi, has a strong um, reaction to offering payment in cash. Um, in very few circumstances will they allow people to pay in cash, at least for social and behavioral research. Um, and this is typically justified by their concern that in a context where cash is quite rare, most of the people that I'm interviewing are subsistence farmers, they don't earn a wage, um, that any offer of cash is going to be um, coercive or at least um, meet the, the bar for undue influence. And so they prefer, honestly they will suggest you give nothing. Um, if you're unwilling to do that, they will suggest that you give something else and I'll talk about what that something else tends to be. The second concern that comes up when you talk about giving cash, it's okay. um, the second thing about uh, giving cash is that, and this came up a little bit in the previous presentation, there's this expectation that it somehow contaminates the data. And this typically comes up in terms of an expectation that people will try to give you the answers that you're looking for. They'll try to figure out what is it that you want and give you the answers that you're looking for more when you're offering cash or some kind of compensation than when you don't. And so it changes um, their responsiveness to researcher demand. Um, and then people also talk about kind of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, that people are willing to talk to you perhaps for an hour and a half when they see that you value the information. But when you give them a dollar, they're like, oh, so you think my information is worth a dollar? Then they're actually unwilling to talk to you. Right, so putting this, this dollar amount, or as I'll talk about in a minute, um, linking it to a bar of soap actually reveals to people or their perception that you actually value their information much less than they perceive when you don't pay. Third um, is that in many cases, especially around reimbursement of actual costs, it's just impractical in the settings where I work to reimburse people. Right? They're, when they're taking a minibus to come to the study site um, or they're hiring a bicycle to take them, they're not getting a receipt. Um, and so what this means is that you end up offering a flat fee for everybody and this generates intense um, anger, right? Somebody had to come 10 kilometers and they get the same amount of money that somebody that lives near the research site. And so you have to come up with kind of tiers of distance. Um, but it's just impractical in many places where to actually reimburse people for the costs of either their time um, or their, the money that they had to pay to get there. 
Okay, so what can you give instead? Um, I would say the, the most common thing that researchers in the Malawian context give is um, something that they see as valuable kind of day-to-day -day goods. The most popular one is soap. Right, so a bar or maybe two bars of soap are often given in exchange for answering a survey. This is framed as a, a kind of small token of appreciation. Um, others have given salt, oil, sugar, kind of basic necessities to people. Um, I'll talk in, in the next slide about why ultimately people have come to prefer soap over those. Um, but it also has kind of practical benefits. It doesn't spoil, it's um, prepackaged stacks easily in boxes. There's lots of reasons why people like giving out soap in response um, to surveys. I, early on in my field work, gave photographs um, as something that people valued and didn't have access to and was seen as kind of something fun to receive. This is much less valuable now that um, smartphones are more ubiquitous and people actually are able to take photos. Um, but there are alternatives, but by far the most common um, for cash is soap. And this is despite the fact that almost all respondents prefer cash over soap, right? No one prefers to get soap over cash. If they wanted soap, they can buy it, and if they don't, they can use the money for something else. Okay, some of the ethical things that have come up for me around compensation for participation have to do with um, different ways in which members of the community react or understand what that, um, that gift or that payment is in ways that potentially put them at risk and put the research team at risk. So first is um, suspicions that are linked to existing or pre-existing fears. So this is a cartoon um, that came from a Malawian um, artist. You probably can't read it, but they're basically saying these um, mineral surveying people that have come into their community are bloodsuckers. Right, this seem, might seem bizarre, but this is a really common way that people think about outsiders and why they're in someone's community. This goes back to colonial times, it's well documented as a way in which people think about um, why it is that someone's coming into their community who they don't know and doing all these strange things. So there's fear that you're taking body parts to a lesser degree um, information, but especially blood, and benefiting from it in some way. It's not always clear what the mechanism is. Sometimes. There are really elaborate um, and sophisticated kind of theories about what the blood is being used for. Other times it has more to do with witchcraft and, and curses. Right? That this is gonna be used in some nefarious way. And this actually is obviously in, can induce panic um, in the respondent population. And it also puts research teams at risk. So people are chased out of commu communities fairly regularly um, through kind of mob violence. Uh, the second thing is that the gift may not be understood by the participant in the same way that it's understood by the researcher um, in terms of what it's meant to symbolize. So one way in which that manifests is um, in the case of soap, there are other things that this taps into for the perspective of respondents um, that might have implications for how they understand what it is that they're participating in. So the first is um, soap is a common thing for a male lover or a husband to provide to a wife. This is part of a kind of, um, of a, a sexual relationship expectation. Um, and so this can be both uncomfortable for women receiving soap from strange men, but also for how their husbands or their family members understand what is happening. A second way um, that soap could be understood or misunderstood in some way um, is that it could be linked to historic kind of colonial hygiene campaigns. Right, the use of soap and the distribution of soap was part of a kind of colonial or imperial civilizing mission um, that can be reproduced when you have these young college educated people coming from the capital of a country um, and interviewing people in a rural setting and offering them soap in exchange. And then third, in a culture where patronage or clientelism is a way in which um, people make sure that they can take care of their families, um, an exchange of soap or cash for information can set expectations about future obligations. So there are these stories of respondents who keep consent forms in their homes as proof um, on future need of being able to cash those in for some kind of um, help in the future. Look, I participated in your study. I have your phone number because you gave me your phone number, and now it's your turn to help me. And in some ways, that kind of expectation of you're basically buying future insurance um, is, might be more of an inducement for participants than the thing that the researcher thinks they're giving, which is soap, um, or maybe some kind of promise of implications for the, for the general population. Um, another 
thing that comes up in thinking about um, paying research participants is the inequality that it generates. Um, so we already heard a little bit about um, generating inequality within communities, but in, in circumstances where you're trying to make some kind of claim about um, generalizability, you're trying to generate um, estimates of what people think in general, then you want to draw a random sample. But this does not go over well in small communities where everybody knows each other, right? You come in, you say, look, everybody has an equal chance of participating. Even if you're giving soap, which people roll their eyes at and don't value, it's still annoying that other people got soap and you didn't get soap. And you can explain that it's random and they had an equal chance, but that doesn't really, um, you know, make people feel a lot better when they were not the one that got it. Um, and in most cases, this is just kind of annoyance. But you can imagine with larger incentives um, or repayments that this could generate real animosity in a way that the researcher typically doesn't have to deal with, right? They finish the research, they leave, and they leave this kind of animosity or jealousy in the community. Um, the second is highlighted, I think, best in um, this amazing book by Cal Barrick um, on cooking data. Set. She, she is a ethnographer who embedded within a, um, a longitudinal study and has written about kind of the generation of meaning in these interactions. Um, so I highly recommend it. She does a really good job of walking through the way in which these exchanges basically dramatize the existing differences between the researchers, so that could be me, or that could be the people that I've hired to work with me to collect the survey data, um, like the folks pictured um, in these two photos that I've included. Um, it just underscores the difference, right? These people are coming from the capital, they're college educated, um, they are spending their day talking to these rural villagers and in exchange giving them this small token. Meanwhile, the villagers are watching these guys. They see that they're staying in a hotel. They're driving this four by four. Um, they're eating meat and rice, right? They have this very clear observation that these people are benefiting disproportionately from the labor that's happening that in their view is quite um, equivalent, right? They're, they're part of the same conversation. One is benefiting much more than the other. Um, and then finally, the thing that I hear the most about from my colleagues who are based at the University of Malawi is that payment for subjects um, creates inequality for those that have lots of research funding versus those that don't. So if you're at a university that has very little funds for research and you've had a whole lot of people with um, what seems to be unlimited funds coming in from the outside setting an expectation that you should only respond to a survey if you're paid $5, it becomes very hard for local researchers to do research. So um, people are quite concerned with that. All right, so finally, what can you do? Um, given all these problems, the way that I try to think about it, right, if we're both in terms of the forward looking and the backward um, looking reasons why you might um, pay somebody is to try to basically reduce the need for both of those. For, so reducing the cost to participants has been easier in my line of work than increasing the benefits. So the kinds of things that I do are try to collect survey data in October, which in Malawi is the hot season, typically after people have planted their fields, but when they're waiting on the rains. So one, people are super hot, they're sitting around, they're less likely to be coming and going, they have less going on, and they don't have an immediate need in their main labor area, right? They don't need to go to the fields typically in October. And so making this convenient basically to people um, working around the time when, when their time is of less value to them than other parts of the year. And then b increasing the benefits to the community of your research, I think, requires thinking more carefully about what is it that the community that you're studying values. Um, over the course of my career, certainly been the case that certain topics that I study, people think are dumb and other topics they think are much more important, right? I should be doing the kind of research that the people that I'm asking for their information think is worthwhile. Um, and to do that, you have to start much earlier, right? You don't show up in the village when it's time to collect the data to ask people what they think. Okay, I'll stop there. So I'm Maria, and I don't have a uh, presentation. I just have a loose collection of thoughts, um, sort of a jumble of thoughts about this topic. Maybe not any answers. Um, like uh, Dr. Robinson, I wouldn't present myself as an expert, but maybe somebody who struggled a little bit with this question in my research. Um, uh, so starting off, um, thank you for laying out the terms of compensation, reimbursement, incentives. Um, I think it's helpful to think it through in this way. I don't know that everyone always consistently applies these terms in this way, though, or uses them in this way. And um, 
but it is helpful. And it's also, um, uh, I think, important because not all institutions might have an agreement about what's appropriate. So I came from um, CDC before, and my uh, IRB there would not have let us ever say that we were giving participants incentives. Even though, from your definition, incentive, incentive is given to motivate somebody to participate, we could give, I mean, anytime you give anything, you're motivating, that's the purpose, but we could only portray it as we were, um, uh, we were reimbursing or compensating them for their time or expenses. So either direct uh, expenses that they, um, that they uh, gave up in order to get there, you know, coming uh, in a, the bus or a cab or whatever to arrive, or their time in participating. And that has implications for um, uh, not only the amount that you give, so you would have to tie it strictly to how much they spent um, in time or, or material expenses, or um, in the way that you structure the money. Um, so if I had suggested um, there to my IRB that I was going to pay more at the end to fill out a survey so that I could ensure that the person lasted with me for that you know, full time of follow up, the IRB would have slapped my wrist because that's ridiculous. If that survey at the end took the same amount of time as the survey at the beginning, it would have been ridiculous for me to say I'm going to give more money. And so I would have been strongly they wouldn't have liked it. Um, I didn't know that this was going to be videotaped, or else I would have uh, <laughs> uh, prepared a little better. But um, so, uh, you, so thinking about the way your institution thinks about it, I think is important to make sure that you're be adhering to the way that they um, approach this topic. Um, in terms of giving cash, I o um, almost always give cash or something closely tied to the equivalent. So in one of my sites, we don't give cash, but it's not because um, of for the issues um, laid out here, but more because of maybe a lack of stronger ways of auditing it, so people being concerned with um, loss, losing the cash. And so um, in that site instead, um, cell phones are universally used. Uh, we give ca uh, credits, so people load their card that load their cell phones. And so that's a nice way so that we can maintain documentation that it was given. So just for auditing, it's a very nice, easy way. Um, we haven't ever given other things, never given soap um, or any sort of study branded swag. But I think in part that's because I often work with low risk, high risk folks or folks maybe in a, um, a, a, a core risk group where we are sensitive to trying to never identify them as being part of the study. So a lot of my work has been done with female sex workers or people at high risk of HIV. And so you don't, you think very carefully about um, how, you know, what would you give them that would put them at risk of someone knowing that they were participating in the study. And even something, you know, like soap, if it was soap that they wouldn't be able to buy that brand in the market, that could identify them. So we've always been very careful about that and even had conversations um, about you know whether we were going to make them take the signed consent form, um, you know they might not want to take that signed consent form because having that could identify them. And so giving them the option, you know, if the IRB makes them take it, just making sure you have a trash can by the door <laughs> that they know will be carefully taken care of, where they could dispose of it if they wanted. Um, so how do I set the amounts of cash or phone credits? Um, I mostly work in low-income settings um, and with partners and I always defer to what they want, the, what they want to give. And I feel like I'm often, I feel like the amounts are too low and it's um, not so much a concern that I want to be um, overly influence them, but a concern of it just doesn't seem fair to expect them to do this for not paying them enough, but really um, working with the site to make sure that they think it's a, a fair amount. And I have, I have to defer to them because I have no idea about that. Um, I think often they are setting it based on what uh, Dr. Robinson talked about, um, this idea you don't want to set the bar too high for other studies that don't have funding. So they're doing research full time, they're there, they don't always have people coming in with NIH funding or foundation funding, and so they don't want to set it, the expectations where they might not be able to um, do that in their next study. So I think that's often the constraint, more so than thinking it's going to be um, overly influencing participants, frankly. Um, they don't want to set that bar too high. Um, I also, though, all, always work with a local IRB, even if, or an equivalent, or something the best I can come up with for that. So even if not required to do that, um, I've never done a study where I didn't have um, some sort of local institution reviewing it, because I wouldn't expect the IRB here to be able to assess that amount. I wouldn't expect them to know whether that was overly influential or not. Um, and so not all places have a functional 
a functioning IRB. And in so those settings, you either have to become creative or think about what you have to work with. So in one of my settings, I work with the Ministry of Health has an ethics committee, and so we go through that, and that works fine, and it probably would be something we would need to do anyway. But in other places that don't, you know, there could be another IRB not affiliated with that institution, but some settings don't even have that. And so then um, I've, con uh, 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 consult I've contracted with a um, company that does it, so there are companies that do IRB reviews. Um, but in that case, I've only done this once, but I made sure that they had a local, um, somebody from an academic institution who does research in that setting, hoping that they would be able to provide that. Um, I think there are a lot of other ways, though, that research could pose issues of undue influence besides compensation. And um, so I feel like I struggle a lot, and this might be getting a little bit too off topic, but I think to me these seem like often like the more um, difficult questions. So if you're doing a research where you have an intervention group, um, you're offering them something, they might think that by participating in this study I'm going to get better care. Um, and so they might want to do it to get your study intervention. And so that's difficult to think about, right? Also, even though we put a statement in the consent form that um, participating in the study is not going to hurt your, uh, by choosing not to participate in the study won't hurt the care that you receive at this clinic, um, I'm not sure that people always believe that, right? And in fact, I think sometimes by putting that statement in there, we might be introducing <laughs> the idea. So <laughs> if you're working in some place where people, you know, there isn't the strong sense, the strong history or, or practice of following what the laws are, the written laws are, putting that in um, where people don't follow the laws routinely could suggest to them that if you participate in this, you're going to get better care. And so that's a concern. Um, besides ethical concerns that participating in the study, uh, that paying people to participate in the study, paying people can also, as um, Dr. Uh, Prasad pointed out, it could prompt them to lie. Um, it can also prompt them to lie to uh, join the study. So for my research, I usually try not to advertise the, um, the criteria that they would have to meet in order to be eligible for the study. So you might tell a general one, like if it's only women, okay, you might say that. But for other things, if they have to be maybe sexually active or sexually active not using a condom or specific things, I wouldn't tell them that because I wouldn't want them to misrepresent themselves in order to enroll in it. But people are smart and they often figure it out. And so there are instances of paying, especially when you set the amount where people want the money, um, there, I think, are lots of examples of people misrepresenting in order to join the study. And so um, and a very early example was um, by one of my mentors um, at, uh, in North Carolina, um, Dr. Marcus Steiner. He published in 2001 in JAMA a study where they did where they had enrolled people through advertising and then the study participation was only by telephone and they went back and looked at those phones and the time that the calls were placed and found that people were were in effect enrolling in the study multiple times. And so I think it's a concern. The more money you give, uh, you know, the more you need to worry about people enrolling um, multiple times, possibly double uh, enrolling. This also came out in um, a study I wasn't involved in, but Caprisa in South Africa, uh, a microbicide study. So a study where they were um, giving women a gel to use that in the hopes that it would prevent um, the acquisition of HIV. They enrolled people, and um, there was another trial giving another microbicide uh, that was, they thought, far enough away that people wouldn't be double enrolling, but they found as the study progressed that actually a lot of women, uh, they found almost 200 women appeared to have enrolled twice, which has concerns um, not just for, uh, you know, that they're enrolling twice, but they're getting two different products. And so if they're using both of these, you know, is that harmful? What kind of harms could there be from using it? And it also, of course, messes up what you care about. It messes up your data because you're getting the results, but you don't know that's from your product. It could be from the other product. And they didn't think that this was going to be an issue because of the amount that they were giving them, because the distance between the sites, because they were asking them whether they enrolled in two sites, but they found, in fact, it was. So just to say that when you do give compensation or, um, or reimbursement or incentives, when you give money, it increases the risk that people will join and um, maybe not 
uh, completely be transparent about what they're doing. Um, I have more thoughts, but is my 15 minutes up? <laughs> well, um, why don't we, I, you guys have already answered a lot of the sort of questions that we've come up, but I'm going to maybe ask some sort of like summary questions because I think that it'll be really interesting to hear just across panel how you would respond to some of these questions that are related to some of the things that you've already said. Um, first, thank you so much for your insights. I've learned so much already. Um, so let me just, um, on a procedural ground, so we've talked a little bit of the big picture and we've talked about cases, but on a procedural ground, like how does it work on the ground and also ideally, um, at what point in the research project does and maybe should your team or do you decide on the payments, reimbursements, compensation uh, protocol? Um, and who should be involved in that decision? Um, is it during IRB review? Do you, do, do you think that it requires participant representatives? Um, who should be involved in the decision and when during the sort of setup of the study? I can start. Um, I think it, I've done it lots of different ways. I would say the dominant way that this has worked in my experience is that the study is designed prior to any kind of local input. Mm -hmm. um, and that typically, like a local research firm or local collaborators will intervene if they think it's worth it. I mean, it took, there's a lot of power dynamics there and there's a lot of times that people just say, fine, if this is what you want to do, we'll do it. And they know it won't work, but they you know, haven't been asked. and. It's not really their, in their interest to, to help you figure it out. But if you have collaborations um, or, or buy-in, then having people say this is not going to work for a number of reasons um, typically comes you know, close to implementation rather than early um, in the process. I don't think I've been a part of any research where the participants themselves or a representative of the participants um, have a say in what gets said as the compensation. Um, I think often people think of these um, elite researchers as stand-ins mm -hmm. um, for the particip participant population, but as we've heard, you know, across um, multiple of us, there's, they often have multiple um, different com competing interests, and not just better re best representing the respondents. So I um, have sat on an IRB, but I actually haven't conducted research myself, so I'm not coming from a perspective where I've done the design. So that's something that really struck me um, from both of your presentations was the potential for um, divergent interests um, within a community that you're conducting research on. So you have the interests of people who might be participants, you have the interests of non-participants, and then you have the interests of your local researchers. And it sounded to me like there were actually really clear conflicts potentially between local researchers who might prefer to have payment low or non-existent um, and um, local potential participants who it would be really interesting to know empirically would they actually prefer payment? Would they actually find some level of payment um, maybe even in cash to be valuable? When I think about other examples like say, you know, um, you know uh, some philosophy departments that were less well funded were uneasy about a new department that wanted to offer higher stipends to graduate students, I feel like less sympathetic with the <laughs> universities that want to, I, I see why they have that interest, but I tend to think the interests of the potential participants as it were might also be very important. Um, obviously there are differences with, with research, but I'm interested in how, um, if you all can say more, you know, if you've sort of how you navigate quest, uh, situations where your local research partners might have interests that are divergent mm -hmm. from the interests of either participants or other actors in the, in the community with, with respect to payment. Sure, so um, I, this is just sort of repeating what I said before. I mean, I have to defer to them because I don't have a good sense of what's on the ground. And we've never gone out and asked participants what it would take to get them to enroll in the study or what they think is fair to enroll in the study. Um, instead, I um, rely on my in-country collaborators. But my in-country, but maybe in my defense, my in-country collaborators, I think, are good. Like, they're good ethical people. I wouldn't be working with them if I didn't feel strongly about that. So I think they have a good sense. They've never said that they don't want to pay them. They always want to pay them something. They're also practical, and I don't think it's realistic that we would probably enroll people, be able to successfully do this if we didn't give people some sort of um, motivation to to enroll in the study. Um, so it's more working with them to 
set the amount. And so that's always something that we do um, uh, sort of fairly in the early in the process while we're setting up the design so that we can know that we also can afford whatever it is that we're proposing. But um, and I might push them a little bit to make sure that it truly is enough, but at the end of the day, I'm going to rely on what they say. Yeah, one thing that is interesting about the inequity question between the like well-funded research programs and maybe more local research programs is whether the non-funded local research programs are actually asking questions that are more relevant to yep. the community and whether that also has, it's not only about inequity, but about whether or not the community itself is getting some sort of benefit from participation in this research and thinking about those issues um, also further complicates uh, payment structures. Um, okay, so another question that we haven't talked about, so I would, I just want to hear what you guys have to say is just sort of, um, are there certain research questions or projects for which you think it would be wrong to offer money? Why? Um, and maybe even are there certain research where uh, questions or projects where it would be wrong to compensate in any way besides the sort of compensation in, in kind for participating in research? Well, maybe I'm not creative enough in my thinking, but I can't imagine that I would, I can't imagine doing research where I wouldn't pay people at least for their time. I mm -hmm. get paid, I wouldn't be doing this job if I wasn't being compensated for it. So it seems to me a question of respect. Mm -hmm. But I've heard from people in the community, um, uh, people researching, and maybe not from OSU, not from an academic institution, but people saying like, yeah, we didn't pay people to do that because we didn't want to be coercive, which is just an interesting perspective, and I think sometimes it comes from the place like maybe they didn't have money to pay, but it's an interesting idea that they're thinking that any amount of payment is by, by design coercive. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a somewhat common perception among people. So I think the question is really interesting. I, I would find it really hard to think that there's a research question as a whole that would make that it would be sort of ever, like wrong across the board to pay, or I also find it actually sort of striking to whether it would ever be sort of um, required across the board to pay. So reflecting on Amanda's examples, it seems like it's often going to be sort of highly specific to the background circumstances of your participant population. So like when I think about, for instance, if you were doing research on um, uh, you know law professors. I would be less concerned about them being sort of uh, uh, disrespected or exploited by somebody doing research that um, didn't offer financial payment, especially if it offered, um, if it connected with something that they were interested in. Um, with a group that was less economically well off, I would worry more about exploitation. And then in Amanda's examples, I tend to think this is a case where it looks like there are cultural dynamics in this population where the social meaning of money. Um, I, I revert on social meaning of money here because it seems like it really varies in different contexts in our society and, and in the society maybe that you um, do research in where like, like we would find it really sort of strange, right, if when you had, you know, um, a graduation speaker or something and you were thanking them for coming to your institution, it would be strange to give them like um, some, some cash. I think that would be, a, even in our society, which I think is more willing to use cash um, socially, I think that would be a case where the social meaning of money is um, such that it's not an appropriate um, token of appreciation there. An appropriate to token might be things like flowers or something symbolic. And what's interesting is it sounded like the social meaning of money and, and of soap and of other goods in Malawi is sort of really location specific and unique. Um, and I think that's something that um, makes that question hard to give an across the board answer to. You. Yeah, so I mean, one of the, the biggest projects that happens in public opinion across sub-Saharan Africa is called the Afrobarometer. It's a comparable survey that's done in like 40 countries every year, um, focused on people's political attitudes and in particular support for democracy. And my, some of my colleagues in Malawi are part of that effort um, across the continent. And they really believe that somehow compensating respondents robs them of the meaning of what they're doing. So the way that they'll often talk about um, people's response is no, literally no one has ever asked me what I thought. 
Right? This is the first time somebody has asked me what I thought about these particular issues. Um, and that they feel that commodifying that somehow will, will reduce that sense of voice or empowerment. I mean, I think they drink their own Kool-Aid a little bit, but they really believe that asking people about these topics that they don't tend to be asked about, especially in more authoritarian settings, is a kind of, um, is something of value in and of itself that is somehow cheapened by compensation. Um, I don't want to speak too much for them, but that's my understanding Can of the ask, way that. Yeah. What do you think they would say if you proposed to try to get at this empirically? So to try to get at either participants' views about whether they would like to be paid or value payment, or um, look at something that's sort of a proxy for whether payment was distorting responses, as Maria talked about some of her studies, or dis dis distorting something else. Yeah. Would they say if you, because it sounds like they have a kind of commitment to this sort of vision of payment as being odious in some way, but I'm curious what you think they might say if you wanted to try to get empirically at something related. I mean, the clearest way to do that would be some kind of experiment where it's randomized who you pay or not, which would potentially introduce its own problems as, as people understand that some people are being compensated and others not. It sounds like you've done research precisely on this. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure that there's some work that's looked at this. Maybe somebody in the audience will know about the distorting effects of, of compensation on patterns of response to surveys. Um, yeah. So um, there's about 30 minutes left, and I think that people probably have a lot of questions in the audience. I'm going to stand up and walk around with Mike, so please raise your hand. Um, feel free to introduce yourself and ask the question as concisely as, and succinctly as you can so that we could get to a lot of people. Thanks. Hi, I'm Hillary Rosebrook from the Government Resource Center. Um, at OSU. So I tried to write this out so that I could actually um, say what I'm meaning to say or ask what I'm meaning to ask. So as far as um, public policy research or social science research, um, it really stood out to me the idea that, um, that some IRB uh, members uh, are against the idea of people being financially motivated. Um, I mean, how do we know that the population of people who are financially motivated aren't different than the people who would do this for altruistic purposes only? And in that case, they would be left unrepresented in public policy research. <laughs> okay, that was all I, that was my question. <laughs> question. I mean, I think you're right. It, if there's, um, you know, the same kind of thing that I think people are worried about in offering compensation, that it will differentially induce some people to participate, um, that we might be worried about, I think, of marginalized. The flip side of that is exactly what you're saying, that those are the very people that can't afford to participate, can you know, in the example I was giving with the Afrobarometer, can't afford the luxury of this kind of intrinsic value of getting to express your opinions um, and really need some kind of compensation to be able to justify the time that they spend giving their thoughts on something. Um, so I think it's a great point. Yeah, I wanted to respond in a slightly different way to the question, which I think um, I would really like to know more about the way that IRBs think about these questions, um, because I'm going to be a little bit on the soapbox here, but it, it strikes <laughs> me as often, um, I, this is my conjecture, that there's a kind of um, what psychologists call um, moral dumbfounding that maybe happens when payment gets introduced, which is people have a kind of intuitive psychological reaction that there's something objectionable. And, but then it often kind of stops there, and I think coercion for some reason ends up being the word that gets used to describe the sort of reaction that there's something odious or troubling about payment. And um, I'm sort of flip, flip, flip it around to try to understand better, because I often have a hard time understanding what the reasons are that are motivating IRBs or other actors sort of concerns about payment. I thought um, Amanda's presentation nicely captured for me some of the reasons in Malawi why payment might be sort of distinctively objectionable. But just articulating it by saying, oh, it's coercive or something doesn't seem like it captures the nuance of, well, it might um, you know, create inequality in the community or something. And so um, your question seems exactly right to me that it's going to, both paying and not paying are going to introduce um, different incentives in who responds. And I think the question for IRBs should be, you know, is payment going to introduce distinctive, worse population distortions than not paying? And 
articulate more clearly than coercion what it is that's concerning about payment, because that can help us understand, you know, for instance, would in-kind compensation be okay, or would in-kind compensation be dis distorting? Hi, I'm Donna Lomahuna in the College of Nursing um, here at OSU. Um, so um, I, I've been on um, IRBs in, in Ireland, though, we're called a little different, but um, and our kind of reflections on these issues are not just, oh, it's coercion. Uh, they really are trying to evaluate things um, to see where or why there might be problems. And a lot of times it does come down to the risks that um, would appear to be uh, in the project. And I think that's where something like a, a phase one uh, kind of experimental project where there's a, a relatively unclear set of risks involved with, uh, with an experimental drug and um, you know that, that raises concerns about whether or not the um, the participants who feel like that whatever the compensation is, if that's something that um, um, we just say, like people with less income are going to feel like, well, that hundred dollars or thousand dollars is is worth it to me to feed myself compared to somebody else uh, saying, well, that's just not I'm not taking that risk because nobody knows what this thing is going to do inside me. Um, and then I think you've got the, the kind of the classic examples of the, like the TGN fourteen twelve trial in London, and then a similar one in France, where really bad things happened with experimental drugs, and um, that's where I think some of that fear comes from. But it, I think it does come back to this risk um, uh, in the unknown, and then the fact that uh, you know there could be this differential selection of those with less income are going to be more in, more kind of drawn to take the higher risks. That's really helpful. So it sounds like, if I'm getting your question right, the concern that people were raising on your IRB or REB, or I'm not sure what they're called in Ireland, was about um, whether fair subject selection would be distorted by offers of payments, whether you'd end up with a skewed sample. The TGN case seems a little different, because I agree that the experimental research raises ethical questions. Other than skewing the sample, I'm trying to work out why we would be distinctively worried about payment in those and about whether um, sort of different types of payment might raise different questions. So like, would the offer of reimbursement, for instance, um, raise fewer concerns about skewing a sample than the offer of um, a sort of very large incentive? I think is I'm curious, from people's experience, how much does the IRB intervene with this? So I've been doing this work for two decades, and I have some of my research includes products that are not have no regulatory approval. They have not undergone it, and I've never had the IRB ever come to me and tell me rethink the amount that you're paying people. I've had them question other ethical aspects of my work, <laughs> um, but I've never had them say that the payment is wrong or the payment schedule is wrong. And so maybe I'm just doing it right, or the people that I'm relying on are getting it right. But my sense is that the IRB, I don't know how much they really know about the individual context that each of us are doing our research and how much you would you should be relying on them to to provide the right guidance in this area. I'm curious if anyone's ever had the IRB tell them they're wrong. So, yes, yes we have. <laughs> well, thank you for being brave enough to say that. Sure. Um, no, it, it turns out that there are, especially at OSU, they have a set of policies um, related to different kinds of research, and some of them have limitations on how how much you can give to one participant per t you know um, time period. So yes, you can be giving the wrong incentive amounts. <laughs> so that amount because of tax purposes, or just because no, it's that's an ag it's an agreement between I, the one I'm thinking of. I believe is an agreement between um, HHS and OSU. So I'm not quite sure who decided and how they decided. But it does exist. That's really interesting. Hi, unpaid undergraduate subjects, the ethics. 
I think you should tell us, Tom. <laughs> um, I mean, in political science, we have a, a pool. I think it's similar to what psychology will often do, where there's extra credit offered for participation instead of payment. Um, and in terms of IRB intervention, what I've seen, especially with undergrads, is they typically, they just don't want cash being given. I think aside from the, um, the kind of documentation or auditing, there's always a preference for like gift cards over cash, and I'm not actually sure why. Um, so if somebody knows, it would be useful to know what the justification is, because I think from the participant's perspective, they certainly would prefer cash. I think this, this strikes me, maybe this is just not as somebody who hasn't done research, certainly not a big social science pool. It actually strikes me that, uh, on the top of my head, extra credit seems like, in various ways, a more troubling <laughs> incentive yes. than cash, yes. although it has the convenience yes. that as a faculty member, it's certainly cheaper for me yes. to yes. hand out. In fact, if I'm doing a curved class, it's just free if everybody gets yes. next year. So, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I think it's really common inside, but I, it's interesting that people don't talk about this much with payment, but I actually think it seems more troubling to me. So I want to pick up on some of the questions that have been asked and ask it a little differently. So we talk about uh, compensation, we talked about cost, and in one of your slides you say it's pretty hard to figure out cost. And, and really it is because it's individual, right? So what it costs for me to give up my time is going to be different than um, somebody else to give up their time. Um, and, and while I think it's a it may be a regulatory nightmare, I want to keep the regulatory nightmare part of this out and sort of ask ethically. So, so shouldn't the participant have an opportunity to, to say to you what they perceive the incentive to be? So do I perceive the incentive to be coercive? So what would it mean for me to think that a payment is coercive? What do I think a payment would be to actually compensate my cost? And it clearly is not the case that every individual that enrolls has the same perception of that item, whether it's soap or dollars, and it doesn't mean the same thing to them. So why aren't we thinking more broadly about differential payments across subjects because it might hit the bias question a little better so that you would get high-end people, high-income in people to uh, play in the research space as well as low-income people, so. I think this is just an, an area that I find fascinating because, so here's the sort of hypothetical that I think your question raises that I think is really interesting is, say you're trying to do a kind of stratified maybe survey research trial in medicine or, pub, or public health, and you're trying to get um, people to give you feedback um, who are, say, medical residents, who are attendings, and who are like maybe undergrads interested in medical school or something. Um, to get response rates that are going to be adequate, you, it will make sense to pay really different amounts to those groups because the marginal value of the time they're giving up um, is really different. But I think people are often really troubled by the fact that this is kind of replicating an existing like background inequality in the pay of like attending physicians versus undergrads. And so I think this kind of presents a, a sort of trade-off between um, wanting to have incentives that don't skew samples and get you the sample that you want to answer your research question, which would seem to sort of point toward paying differentially. And then I feel like the concern that people have on the other side is about distributive justice, where they worry about this differential payment kind of um, reproducing this inexistence existing um, inequality. I, I tend to think, and I think I've said this in the paper on differential payment, I think it can, in practice, we actually do see studies doing that in um, social science, and I think that that generally tends to be considered okay, sometimes because you don't have the same populations all in one stratified study, you're doing different studies. I think it gets more controversial since when you're talking about medical research, when you would be drawing in different populations, and again, where you don't want to have a skewed sample. I think people are more troubled about wanting to say pay for not a flat rate based on the kind of prevailing wage for doing that kind of work, but instead paying um, to make up for the alternative value of what your time would have been on otherwise. I think you're exactly right that like if you could submit something saying like what you would have gotten paid otherwise, it probably would incentivize in a way that creates a more socially representative sample, but it would cost more, and I think people would also be troubled about the 
inequality um, replication. I, th I think it's really interesting. I kind of like the idea, but I think um, a lot of IRBs don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just add, besides the um, you know, questions of perpetuating in inequality in wages and the question of increasing your cost of the study, to me, like the much more pressing just issue is it would just be really hard to do this in terms of p participants talking to each other and the potential that you're going to have for bad feelings. Like, it's even hard doing a randomized controlled trial when some people get the intervention and some people don't if it's open, if it's unblinded. That's hard enough. Like, that's hard enough for people to wrap their head around, like, they got the product but I didn't. Like, that's really unfair, even though you've maybe spent all this time trying to explain the concept of randomization and that, you know, it wasn't intentional. We had, we didn't know who was going to get it. That's hard enough. I can't imagine if they left with differing amounts of money. I mean, yeah. so, they so probably I, just, I'd never be able to do research there again. So my response, though, is, is that if, if in fact we think the most salient ethical reason to compensate people is because we're actually compensating them for uh, lost wages or lost time, if we don't differentially examine that, then our reason is probably fooling ourselves, right? Because um, again, if you want, if you want across the spectrum social uh, strata, um, you're not going to reimburse my cost. That is, you know, uh, somebody at a high-end salary. If you're reimbursing me at the same sense, same amount as a, um, a low-income wage earner, so your rationale, your sort of ethical basis for saying payments okay, is because I'm 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 reimbursing you for your time, and so you're not losing anything, isn't the same argument across the wage spectrum. That's my only sort of trying to push a little bit on that. Yeah, but I think it would be it would be tough to explain, right? And um, yeah, yeah, that people. I think that the distinctions that you made about are we compensating, are we reimbursing people for lost time, or are we compensating them for effort? I think subjects are much more likely to think of it in the latter. I gave an hour, you gave an hour, you gave an hour. We should be paid the same for that effort, which is a very different way of thinking about it than replacement for what's lost. So I can give an example, though, of differing amounts that actually, um, so I'm leading a, a population-based survey of women in Ohio, but we're not doing the actual work. It's subcontracted out to someone else. And so they set up the d design and which they send out the questionnaires for people to complete. And those that don't complete them and need repeated, they offer increasing amounts of payments. Mm -hmm. And that's a possibility. And I think, you know, that can work because people are unlikely in this setting. It's such a low proportion of people um, participating, they're not being approached to participate. It's not like you're recruiting from a single clinic, which is very different where people are going to talk. And I just don't see any way that you're going to get that to fly where you're giving them different amounts. But in a different setting where people are not, it's not a cohort where you're geographically recruiting them from the same location. I see that could potentially work. Uh, well, first of all, I, I've uh, actually participated in research, so you might have questions for me. but. Uh, <laughs> To build on what some of the earlier points, I was wondering, what if there's a research project, say, for a, uh, a pill that could uh, uh, cure breast cancer, and so you, you do the clinical trial and you pay people to come and get their, pay their parking dough issue and get some blood draws and things, but eventually it proves successful, it makes millions of dollars for a drug company. Is there any consideration of the ethics of, you know, you've paid people $50 on the trial, but if they had, you know, 0.005% of the drug, they could, you know, get a lot more compensation. Is that, what's the ethics of that? So Being this, paid a small amount for something that makes a lot of money for somebody. So this, this, this came up actually when I was writing the paper with Holly and Emily on differential payment, and we had different views about this. I actually think that it could sometimes make sense to compensate participants more if their data turned out to produce, say, you know, the, the blockbuster, you know, solves the BRCA mutation or something, um, drug. But my co-authors had a, d a different view, which I think kind of goes back to what Amanda was saying about um, effort versus like uh, what ends up resulting. Where what they were saying was, well, in this case, it's not like you work harder or sacrifice more to produce uh, useful data than non-useful data. It's sort of luck in some sense. Um, and so they were troubled by the idea that you should have different compensation for a successful than an unsuccessful trial. What I said in response is, well, 
Uh, that's also like how NIH grants and other things work. There's sort of some luck. I mean, researchers do engage in effort, but there's also luck in what, and yet there's really differential compensation for this. But I think it, it does kind of come down to whether you think of an appropriate aspect of compensation being compensation for the um, benefits you provide to science or to the researcher, um, and or whether you think of it as just um, compensating for effort or burden, in which case it looks more the same. You mentioned that you, um, Amanda, that you sort of think about um, pay payment or I guess um, SOAP in your studies as being a way of recognizing the fact that you're getting a lot from these participants. Would you ever think of like, if you got something that like got into, I don't know, um, APSR or something, giving them extra soap or more for something, <laughs> compared to something that, that, that didn't work out, or would that just seem strange? I don't know. Um, I think they would think that was strange. But also, I think it, yeah, I mean, I think it could complicate these kind of experimenter demands where now they're not just meant to be giving you ideally truthful information, but now we're part of the same team where we're trying to, we're trying to prove something, we're trying to get a certain result, seems like potentially uh, potentially bad for science to have not just the um, person conducting the study have clear incentives to produce a result um, or in the drug company case to produce something that that works and makes a lot of money but now you have all the subjects working towards that end too seems like a lot more possibility for bias and and kind of yeah misreporting so I'll ask uh, do no. no. Uh, so one thing that we haven't talked about is um, community benefits and payment versus individual participant benefits and payments. And so I'm wondering how thinking about, especially some of these worries about inequality within community that some of these payment structures may have, how to think about community like engagements and then also community compensation for participation in research rather than just the individual participants. So one thing that I, so the way that this often works in practice, there is a step um, in most of my research that requires a kind of community level buy-in, um, which is, is completely necessary in the context of rural Malawi. If you have not gone through certain levels of authority and held some kind of community meeting explaining to everybody what's going on, you're going to have very little compliance. Um, but it also introduces the possibility of collective enforcement or coercion where if the chief and the kind of elders have decided that this is a study that's worth doing, then it removes the um, possibility of individuals declining to participate, for example. Um, I think the flip side is something we were talking about before. There's been um, a huge increase in the number of field experiments in political science and other social sciences. Um, the Nobel Prize in economics just went to a group of people that kind of pioneered the use of randomized control trials in economic development. Um, and in response to that, there's been um, a huge number of different ways in which people have thought about ethical problems with this type of research. But one of them is that often the costs that are borne by these studies um, are born more broadly than among the population that actually consents. And so it's the, the same kind of thing when the, the cost or the risk is actually much broader than the subset of people that are, that are asked to consider that. Um, I think you could, you know, it's a mirror image of this benefits generalizing beyond those that are giving consent versus not. Are there any other questions from the audience? So one question that, um, one final question that we can talk about that we didn't get to, we sort of have talked about a little bit, was just sort of institutional challenges and maybe lack of institutional challenges. This might be a place where the IRB actually like lets things go, right? Um, so one question is, um, what potential institutional barriers and challenges are to fair compensation and fair payment of research? and if there aren't those kinds of, it's like often when we have these, like the institutional barriers come up pretty quickly in terms of um, some of the challenges that researchers face. So if there aren't, maybe just why, hypothesizing why that is, what is it about payment? Is it just something that isn't seen as intrinsic to the research project? It's something sort of after the fact and it's not sort of as important to research design? Yeah. 
Well, I don't want my comments to be misconstrued as that I want more interference with the IRB. <laughs> <laughs> that was not in my intent. <laughs> but um, I, I like to take this a little bit broader than just payments. To me, like the big issue is um, the bigger problem with um, lack, maybe overly um, undue influence is the inability to design a consent form that participants are likely to understand. And I can't do that because the IRB insists that we have all this language. Language that to me, some of it, I think it's going to, I know, I, I'm fairly confident it's going to be misunderstood. It um, could cause problems, and yet I have nothing to do. I have to include it. And that language is making it more difficult for, you know, there's a limited amount that we can understand before we're just, all of us, before we've reached our max and we can't take it anymore and we're, we're, we're missing that. I can't focus on the parts that I truly want them to understand mm -hmm. because I have to include all this other text that is frankly going to be meaningless to them or cause problems, misunderstandings. And so one of the ways that, you know, I've tried to get around this, and I don't know how successful, but, you know, ways to try to circumvent this issue is um, in some settings, um, so when I was at CDC, we would work with local artists to um, do sort of a uh, drawing, drawings of the consent form. So while we did have to have all the consent language that the IRB insisted on, and we would have to like technically read it to them, at the same time we would show them flip charts that had um, things to try to sh uh, show, you know, how does randomization work by you know flipping a coin and you know relating it to planting different crops in different fields, like working with the local artists to try to convey these difficult concepts. So that, and then also um, including an annotated <coughs> consent form um, where we would embed questions. <coughs> I often use this, uh, it's, and it's pretty easy, you just embed questions in the consent form to stop and have the person, um, uh, so that they're stopping at the same point each time to make sure that the person just understood that concept that you're doing. And if they can't answer it, you know, if they work with them and they can't get it, then that person just isn't eligible to participate. Mm -hmm. So to me, like the bigger issue, <laughs> I mean, maybe I should be worrying more about the payments, but to me the bigger issue is people not necessarily understanding what they're consenting to. Yeah, for me the big institutional barrier is the National Commission for Science and Technology in Malawi will not allow cash payments. So that's just off the table, so it has to be something else. Um, people have done a lot of the, I like the credit for phones because it's something that people value, but it's still seen as a luxury, um, unlike salt or soap. Um, but they're just as a blanket kind of, um, you're not allowed to do it. I think you are in some medical settings, but not for social research. Would they, would they let you do the credit for phones? Or? Um, I have not tried it. I know some people have done that. I don't know exactly what their process was within CST, but um, my guess is that they would have similar problems with it. I mean, I think less so from the perspective that is part of the prohibition on cash, which is that it's really hard to offer any amount of cash that's not seen as, as being overly, it's too much basically, any amount of cash is too much. Um, and so maybe they would see the same with credit, I'm not sure. But I think one of the big challenges is that, um, and sometimes this is defensible, like it makes sense that maybe norms in Malawi are different than norms in the US, but there's a lot of inconsistency across time and across IRBs about the way that payment is thought about. And I think, um, some, some efforts people have made to try to have sort of common curricula or training to try to get on at least a page that's understandable to researchers um, what the IRB's um, terminology is, I think, can, can be very useful. Because you see, I was really struck by your example, Maria, of this IRB that thought that you could sort of never um, call something an incentive. So other IRBs might have really different views about that, and I think it must pose challenges for multi-site or if you're sort of moving between different institutions with a study, how to um, make that work out. So please thank the participants and the panelists. Um, thank you for your excellent questions.